Okay. Let's do this. Hey everyone, Stefan here. Before I start today's video, I just want to welcome all the new subscribers to the channel. Like 500 of you joined since the last video. And uh, I'm really happy to have you. My channel is a little bit more casual than your average history channel. I talk a lot about archaeology, prehistory, the Stone Age, and that'll definitely continue going forward. Some months are slow, some months are busy. I can't always make a, a video every week, and sometimes the videos are shorter just because I need that space to do research. So all my videos this month in March are all about Hawaii, and they're just short little videos because I just went there, and then that's giving me the space to do big research project on Neanderthals, which will be April's videos. Even got a, an exact replica of a Neanderthal spearhead, so super cool, happy to have you. Let's start the video, skiddly do. So last week's video on how the Egyptians might have built the pyramid was pretty popular by the standards of my channel, thanks to the big collab, I appreciate that. But there was a small but vocal minority who really took issue with what I had to say. They assert, based mainly off the teachings of Robert Schock, a geologist here in America, that the Sphinx, and therefore by association the pyramids, are much older than we think, about 15, 7,000 years ago, much, much older. It doesn't matter how much evidence that we have that the Egyptians built the pyramids, the fact that there is only artifacts from ancient Egyptian civilization around them, they contend that the erosion on the walls of the Sphinx was caused by rain and that the last time it rained substantially was 15 to 7,000 years ago. Excuse me one second. Well now the moldy old slipper is on the other foot and we're going to look at that argument and see if the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis holds water. Bear in mind, there's no conspiracy here. All my sources are in the description and anyone can check them out. They are free online. All of them apart from one are available free online. So if you disagree with me, consider reading some of the sources that I read. All right, let's break this down bit by bit. First, let's talk about erosion. Robert Schock contends the erosion around the Sphinx enclosure could only have been caused by rain and that it hasn't rained substantially since the Old Kingdom to make that level of erosion. Well, that is by no means the only geological force going on around the Sphinx enclosure. Other geologists say that all these marks and things around it were caused by groundwater, tectonic forces, and merely exposed by the uh, Egyptian masons when they carved out the enclosure around the Sphinx. Likewise, the Sphinx is undergoing a lot of erosion at the minute. That could be caused simply by the dew in the morning. The limestone is porous, the dew gets sucked in at night, it dissolves salt crystals in the rock in the morning when the dew evaporates, they deposit these salt crystals. This puts pressure on the outer layer of the rock and they flake off. Different levels of limestone have different pores and different levels of salt, so they erode differently, causing this wavy effect we see on the rocks. So basically what you need to take away from this is that there is no geological consensus around the fact that this erosion was caused by rain. That's by no means certain. Another piece of damning evidence for the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis is the context that the Sphinx is in. Nobody can deny, even Robert Schock himself, that it is in the context of Caffrey's funerary masterpiece, okay? Funerary enclosure. It's where <laughs> it's surrounded by all of Caffrey's stuff, basically. Now, isn't it fortuitous that this ancient civilization, 15 to 7,000 years ago, cut the Sphinx enclosure wall at the line of Caffrey's causeway? How would they know to do that? Indeed, the drainage ditch of that causeway leads into the back of the enclosure, and how they relate to each other leads archaeologists to believe that the causeway was built first, before the Sphinx enclosure. 
how does Robert Schock account for this? Well, he maintains that Caffrey must have extended the Sphinx enclosure, that it was originally a rectangle and he extended it at the back and cut that diagonal line. Well, if that's the case, then these walls should show no erosion, right? Because according to his theory, it hasn't rained enough since Caffrey's time to cause these marks. Here he is at the back wall, extended by Caffre, calling it... This is classic textbook example of what happens to a limestone wall when you have rains beating down on it for thousands of years. And here he is on his website using the south wall, the one cut by Caffre, as his example of water erosion. So there's a huge contradiction in his argument there. He doesn't really keep his story straight. But let's ignore all of that. He is a genuine geologist, after all, working at a university. Let's say he's right. He also has to prove that it hasn't rained substantially since Khufu and Khafre's time period to back up his claim. Stefan Krapelin of the University of Cologne has been studying the climate in the Sahara, taking cores from a lake bed in Chad. According to his research, the Sahara at the time of Khufu and Khafre, the Old Kingdom, three times wetter than it is now. This evidence is further supported by Judith Bambury of Cambridge University. According to her research, northern Egypt in the 5th dynasty, the dynasty after the Great Pyramid Builders, was more of a Sahel-type environment. That transition between tropical regions and desert regions, again, much wetter than it is now. According to Stefan Krapelin, we wouldn't have the current Egyptian climate until 700 BCE, almost 2,000 years after the pyramid was built. And even now, it still rains around the Sphinx. So let's say he's right that this erosion was caused by rain. That doesn't mean that the Sphinx is as old as he claims. He hasn't proven the point that the Old Kingdom in Egypt was that dry. Another assertion that was thrown at me was that a contemporary source describes Khufu as building his pyramid next to the Sphinx and a temple that already existed. By this, they are referring to the inventory stella. This is not a reliable historical source. It's kind of like an ancient forgery. It was actually written almost 2000 years after the pyramid and around 670 BCE. And this was written during a time of civil war in Egypt, during one of their intermediate periods. The Pharaoh who controlled the region around Giza did renovate a temple at that time. And he is trying to cloak his renovations in the prestige of Khufu. And he's trying to say to his contemporary audience, I am as great as Khufu. We know it was written in that time because it's full of the language of later Egypt. 2000 years had passed between the pyramid builders and that time, and language and art can't help but evolve. It's like if I had to write a Shakespearean play now, using the same paper, same artistic style, same language, I couldn't help but reveal that I am not from Shakespeare's time, that I'm from a later period. So it's not a reliable source. It doesn't outweigh the archaeological evidence we have, and it doesn't outweigh things like the Wadi al Jaf papyrus that is truly contemporary to the building of the pyramids. If all of that evidence isn't enough, the most damning piece of evidence of all, damned, 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 damned to hell, is that there is no evidence of any other civilization. How could they build these huge monuments and leave no trace? They had to sleep somewhere, they had to eat something, but we have no evidence that predates ancient Egypt. Nothing, literally nothing. It is impossible to do all of that and leave no trace. Impossible. Robert Schock gets around this by saying that their civilization was perhaps a coastal one and that rising sea levels since then have buried their civilization. But that doesn't answer anything because they sailed down the Nile and they built these pyramids. So they can't have been that coastal. They must have sailed down the Nile. How is it possible that they left nothing behind? Especially because the archaeological evidence for these time periods that they're talking about are not blank. We know what was going on. For example, 17 to 18,000 years ago, they were living a typical Paleolithic life. Evidence from Wadi Kubania suggests they're eating a lot of roots and tubers, fishing in the Nile, and just living a Paleolithic lifestyle. People criticized me for showing how bronze tools using sand, I did neglect to mention that, that was my mistake. 
could cut through granite. But if these, if they couldn't do it with bronze tools, they certainly couldn't do it with the flint tools that these guys had. And if these weren't the pyramid builders, they were just next to this advanced civilization, did they never trade with them? Again, there's no artifacts left behind, but let's move forward in time to nine to 7,000 BCE. The people of the Sahara Desert had domesticated cattle and they led a nomadic life herding cattle between different water sources. Did these guys build the pyramids? If so, they certainly, again, did not have the technology to do that, just stone tools. If it wasn't them, why didn't they trade with this advanced civilization? You're never going to sell a couple of cows to this huge town of people building a pyramid. It makes no sense. Let's move further forward in time to 5000 BCE. Full-blown agriculture arrives in the Nile for the first time, probably brought there by immigrants from the Near East where the Neolithic Revolution initially took place. And they start forming towns like Marimde in the north of Egypt. And we know full well that this Marimde civilization, Neolithic Egypt evolved into pre-dynastic Egypt. Did Marimde build the pyramids? How come none of their artifacts are around the pyramid site? It makes no sense. If they were next to the pyramid builders, why didn't they trade? How could this town, this civilization spring up next to something else and there'd be no contact? It's impossible. It makes no sense. There's no way around it. There's literally no archaeological evidence for anyone else doing it. So in my opinion, the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis does not hold water. It's a big leaky colander of a theory, not backed up by evidence. In fact, contradicted entirely by a lot of evidence. Take from that what you will. Next week will be my first video on Hawaii. Looking forward to it. And uh, as I said, these are just going to be some short videos and April, big month, my series on Neanderthals is coming out. Thanks for watching. Skiddly ploppity do, skiddly ding dang do, blibbity ploppity do.